make sure we get everyone in. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the annual River Herring and American Eel Survey Training. My name is Ariel Santos. I am a conservation scientist with SeaTuck Environmental Association, and I will be moderating tonight's training. This training will touch on some background about diadromous fish on Long Island. We will go through how to survey for river herring and American eel, then move into breakout groups based on the region you chose to learn more about while registering for tonight's presentation. I am joined by our partners from the Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, Peconic Baykeeper, South Shore Estuary Reserve, and more. I'm also joined by Enrico Nardone, SeaTuck's Executive Director, who will kick off our training for tonight. But first, I'd like to go through some housekeeping notes before we get started. So this training is being recorded and the recording will be available on SeaTuck's website. Please be sure to keep your microphones turned off during the presentations, but feel free to ask questions and discuss amongst the group in the chat box. If you'd like to ask a question live during the Q&A period, you can use the raise hand button and we will ask you to unmute. Our general presentation should last around 45 minutes and then I will begin the breakout room sessions. I'll make a brief announcement that you should, then you should automatically be sent to the regional breakout group you selected. Um, but if you don't get put into a room or would like to change rooms, I'll stick around to help you get to where you need to be. Um, I think that covers everything. So with that, I will hand it over to Enrico. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, as Ariel said, my name is Enrico Nardone. I'm the director at SeaTuck. I've been involved in this river herring uh, survey since I think 2008, which is a long time, but not as long as um, some of the other folks I see on this call. It's good to know there's some some real experts on. I haven't done this training in a while, but I'm good to know that they're here to back me up. Um, i like to start with this image. This is an image created by Brett Bennington at Hofstra University. This is a digital elevation map of Long Island. And if you, if you zoom in a little bit, it kind of gives you a sense of uh, the, the, the glacial history and how it's left all these rivers and streams um, originally carved by glacial meltwater and filled in by our groundwater. Um, these streams are you know, mostly small, groundwater fed, and uh, really represent an, a really important part of the connection between our, our coastal uh, ecosystem and our uplands and our sort of avenues for the movement of sediment and nutrients and wildlife. Um, one of the most important parts of that, the, that movement are what are known as diadromous fish. Um, diadromous is a Greek word that means through running. So these are fish that migrate between salt and freshwater. They split their life cycles between salt and freshwater. Uh, there's, there's two categories of diadromy, and I'm gonna go through, through them both. Um, the first is anadromy. Anadromy is fish. There's that root running again, but this is up. These are fish that are running up, so they split, or they spend most of their life at sea and migrate up into freshwater to spawn. So I. If we were doing this live, I would ask if anybody knows an anadromous fish and that everybody knows they've seen on the Discovery Channel, the famous anadromous fish is the Pacific salmon jumping up waterfalls and past grizzly bears to go to their spawning habitat. We don't have any Pacific salmon. Um, we Even Atlantic salmon were never on Long Island. Our rivers and streams were just too small for them. Um, we have other diadromous fish in the neighborhood that are also uh, too big for our rivers and streams. Our, our uh, 
anadromous fish are river herring. And river herring is not a species name, it's a category that includes these two species, alewives and blueback herring. Uh, in this illustration, they're very easy to tell apart. Of course, in real life, not so much. Uh, so for the purposes of this survey, we just sort of lumped them together uh, as river herring. They're actually quite difficult to identify uh, in the field. Uh, they're both uh, spend most of the year offshore on the continental shelf and in large offshore schools. Um, but then as late winter arrives, they, they do start to move inland, uh, starting in the southern part of the country and working the way up. They, it's sort of temperature driven. So as they move then into our estuaries and bays, uh, they then, when the time is right, they move into our rivers to, to spawn. Uh, sort of the same way salmon do. And I have time in, in quotes here because timing has really nothing to do with it. it has, it's really about the temperature of the outflowing water that they're sensing. And it's usually in the sort of mid to high 40s is the trigger, um, scientists say, that gets them moving into water. And that can, that can vary from year to year. And this, you know, this has obviously been a very warm winter. So we expect that the fish will be moving uh, earlier this year. Uh, they're quite strong swimmers, but not jumpers as they move in, in uh, upstream. Um, and they get into fresh water where they spawn. And this gives you an idea of this video from Rockville Center gives you an idea of what they look like um, as they're milling about. This is sort of their typical spawning behavior, swimming around in circles and milling about, no pun intended. Beautiful fish, I like to say. That characteristic black spot behind their uh, their gills is is usually easy to see. You can get a side look at them. This is what they look like in in sort of shallower water from above. This is Sunken Meadow Creek. Again, same sort of milling about activity. Uh, each female can lay up to a quarter million eggs. They had to these super cute little um, juvenile alewives, which then grow up to about three inches or so in freshwater systems before moving out into the estuary again, reversing that trip that their parents took and moving out to the continental shelf to rejoin the off offshore schools. Uh, they then return as adults after about uh, three to five years and make their first spawning runs. Each adult can then live for, and make that run for another five to seven years uh, throughout their life cycle. And they, they do, they're not um, trying to get to always the exact same spot that they, they were hatched, like some salmon do, but they are, they have site fidelity to the streams where they hatch. So those are anadromous fish. The other uh, version of diadromy is catadromy. These are catadromous fish. Uh, we only have one of these. Um, again, these are, I'm sorry, these are down running. So these are fish that spend most of their life in freshwater and migrate to the sea to spawn. We have one of these, it's the American eel. And they have a really amazing life cycle. They all hatch in the middle of uh, this sort of North Atlantic between the sort of the equatorial currents and the Gulf Stream. And they're sort of planktonic when they first hatch. They're sort of these willow leaf shaped, uh, uh, lep that's the word, um, lep leptocephali. And they're, they're transparent, they have no pigments and they, this, they're sort of drifting on ocean currents. And when they get over the continental shelf, they go through this transformation into an eel shape and start swimming and work their way in, in stream, in, into the estuaries and then into rivers and streams. And uh, when they first come in, this is an idea, give you an idea of what they look like as they're moving into fresh water. They still have um, no pigment, so they're sort of clear glass eels, almost white looking. Uh, I've only seen them in this in this state a few times. You're more likely to see them looking like this. They're They've already, as they start to gain pigment, um, they're not called glass eels anymore, they're called elvers. Um, but they're sort of, again, uh, trying to work their way upstream. 
Well, that they, and just to give you an idea, this is a video from the Mill River again in Rockville Center. I'll give you an idea of what the density of these fish can be. They can gather in huge numbers when the runs are 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 in their height and they're and they're stuck. This is a site where they're stuck. There's really only one place for them to move over this dam, and they're all trying to get up to one place, and they're sort of just congregated there. That's give you an idea of what they look, how big they are. And then they move into the streams. At one time, they were throughout all of North America, all the way up the Mississippi system, all down into the Caribbean and northern part of uh, South America. And they go into the river and, st and streams and, and live there for the bulk of their lives, which can be 10 or 20 years. Um, they can grow to four or five feet long. And um, at some point, they're triggered to return. Uh, they go through a transformation where they lose their eyes, get bigger, their, their fins get bigger and they, they undertake this downstream journey where they swim downstream back out to the ocean and back out somehow to the middle of the Atlantic in the Saragossa Sea and find each other. Scientists have only recently discovered that that's where eels spawn, but it's, they've never seen it. They've never seen an adult eel uh, in this location. The only reason they really know they're spawning there is because that's where they find the smallest uh, larval stages, and that's they have they have tracked uh, with with satellite tags uh, a few eels going to this location. So it's really one of the great um, fish stories, great migrations, and uh, scientific mysteries. It's just re just starting to be sort of uncovered. I always like to add this thing because I know there's this debate about whether there was turkey at the first Thanksgiving, but no debate that there was eel because they were really a state. They were they were so abundant that they were really a staple food of Native Americans throughout the East Coast and um, early uh, colonial settlers as well. So river herring and American eel are two uh, are, are three uh, diadromous fish species. Why are they important? Well, they have this amazing. They both have these amazing life cycles where they're moving from the oceans uh, into our bays and into our rivers and streams and, and then back. So in the process, they're, they're transferring nutrients in, in the form of their own bodies and, and also in eggs in, in the case of river herring. And they're transferring that energy, energy and moving it inland. And um, they, they, you know, they're, they're providing forage for lots of fish while they're out on the continental shelf and their adult forms. As those adults move in to our estuaries, they're feeding a lot of you know striped bass and bluefish and seals and many other species, lots of fish and I mean, lots of birds feeding on these fish. Um, as they move into rivers and streams, otters and raccoons and, and mammals are feeding on them. Uh, lots of bird. This is a gull. Many of you know is a, is called a herring gull uh, because they're known to you know prey on these fish as they move into rivers. Sometimes sometimes gathering along streams by by the hunters to feed. And osprey, osprey, as they're you know, they're, there's evidence that their northerly migration is timed to coincide with the river herring runs. And early in the season, before some of their other prey species are easily available, um, they're really focused on river herring. So, how are these species doing? Well, is this is this, is this sad-looking river herring? makes clear they're not doing so well. The story is not great. And there's two major problems. The, the, the decline is driven by uh, two things. One is this is offshore fishing. They're, they're not a target species, but because they get into mixed uh, schools with Atlantic herring and mackerel, uh, they often are caught up as bycatch. And um, they just, they don't, you know, they're discarded. They don't survive the nets and they really take a, a heavy toll. And I, I just, you know, think I show these pictures because I like to point out that when we're talking about offshore fishing, we're not talking about these mom and pop operations or, you know, the guy with the sort of yellow rain jacket on a little boat somewhere. We're talking about massive offshore fishing with these, you know, huge 200 foot boats with these pair trawls where they're dragging these football field wide nets around for hours and hours. Um, and they're just, they're indiscriminate. They're catching everything. 
And you know, there's no chance of getting the wrong species out of the nets. By the time these fish get back to the boats, they're they're dead and and it's they're lost. So uh, there's a lot of concern that all despite our efforts on on trying to restore habitat on on the mainland side, the the, the offshore bycatch issue is really decimating these populations. But the other problem is that they've they've lost habitat because they can't get to the fresh water that they need uh, either to spawn in or, or to spend their lives in. So this is an example of um, where, where the Carmen's River is dammed at South Haven County Park at Hards Lake. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a massive several hundred foot dam like the Glen Canyon Dam, but it's as far as river herring are concerned, it's, it's a permanent barrier. This is some video from um, a small stream in Baldwin uh, where they're migrating at night and they're trying to get up what amounts to about a, a, a foot high dam at this tidal stage. And you can see, you know, they're just not, they're not able to jump up like a salmon can. They have to try to swim through the water column and it's just not possible. So even, even our low head dams are just not, are, are permanent barriers for these things. I, I find it so sad to watch, but the, the good news at this site, at least, is that when this site on the highest tides on this dam, the, the water overtops the dam. So these fish at least do get upstream to spawn, but in most sites on Long Island, they don't. Um, and then on just switching quickly to eels, eels are amazing fish. And you'll see in this video, they are actually capable of climbing vertical walls in places where they can hold on enough. They're like snakes where they have, if they have two points, they can kind of squeeze and push themselves up. But you'll watch in this video where they're climbing, you'll see how hard it is for them and uh, get an idea that it's, it's you know, it's, some may be able to do it, but if you watch long enough, they mostly climb and eventually fall off. So while it may not be a, an absolute barrier for all eels, dams could create a, a major problem for juvenile eels as well. And these dams were built to power mills like this one on, on the Carmen's River uh, for cranberry bog production, which was a big industry on Long Island at one time, and for ice harvesting. Um, so we're trying on Long Island to, you know, we're engaged many of these uh, CTOC and the, the Baykeeper and other organizations in the Herring Alliance, which is trying to get at the bycatch issue. Um, but mostly we're focused here through an organization we call the Diadromous Fish Work Group uh, on, on the habitat issue and trying to um, address the dams and get these fish past, past the dams into, into good habitat. Uh, that's done by uh, installing dam, um, fish passes. This is again the hard, same Hards Lake Dam with the first permanent fish ladder um, in, installed on Long Island. It was one in 2008. Um, Babylon Village, this is the fishway they put in. You can see the baffles in there. These structures just simply create um, eddies and slow the water down. And the fish, as I said, they're not jumpers, but they're quite good swimmers and they can swim their way up there. And this is not, not a picture from Long Island. This is from Connecticut. This is something we're trying to move to, and that is getting past the legacy of dams on Long Island and uh, just removing them. And we're not harvesting ice or growing cranberries anymore or powering mills. And uh, these legacy dams are not serving their original functions in most cases, but are still presenting significant ecological problems. Um, CTUG is identified with our partners at the estuary programs. Um, the, the, the major places on Long Island where this work needs to happen and compile it into our diadromous fish restoration strategy, um, identifying all the rivers and streams in Nassau and Suffolk County uh, and our river revival map. And, I, and it identifies where in, in green the fish have access and in red where they don't. And if you, you, know, you go through, this is available on our website, you can go through it and. You can see how many, you know, there's almost 
no dam, no rivers or streams in Long Island where um, the fish have, would that have not been dammed or the fish have access. Uh, but the, one of the, the most important things we do and to sort of put wind in the sails of restoration efforts is, is to find these fish and to find them in over 100 rivers and streams is obviously no small task, which is why we're so excited that you're able to join us tonight, have an interest in being involved in our annual uh, river herring and eel survey. Uh, this is really one of the longest running community science projects on Long Island. It's, it's going on uh, close to 20 years. Uh, and in really um, every every project, every fish ladder or um, any other effort that's been completed on Long Island has started with the knowledge that the fish are there trying to move upstream. And in most cases, uh, that work has been done by volunteers. So moving on to the survey and the approach and goals, it's you know it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's a survey that gets volunteers out to look at streams uh, from March 15th to May 15th. Uh, a very simple protocol, which is just we ask that you stay on a, a location and monitor a spot for 15 minutes. Doesn't mean you don't have to stand in the same exact spot, but if you're at a, um, a spillway where a dam is, you can you know, walk around and watch for 15 minutes because it's it's amazing how many times uh, even I in places where I you know even when I know there's fish there sometimes you know it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the situation and and really sort of clue into what you're what you're seeing and and it really you know needs to sort of you just sort of stand there and, and give your eyes a chance to see what's in the water and then we want to know what you're seeing or or not seeing and and um, we've and Ariel is going to touch on. Um, how this works. It used to be a paper-driven process where we ask people to submit uh, forms. Now it's all digitized. We've made it as easy as possible. And um, you know, zeros are important. And we encourage people to tell us if they don't see anything, uh, we want to know that too. Uh, our goals are also pretty straightforward. Where is spawning happening? Uh, what is the reach of that spawning? If they're in a river, how far upstream are they going? And what is the timing of those runs? And then, in, you know, to the extent possible, try to get a sense of how many fish there are, which is difficult in, in our uh, stream sometimes. Uh, specifically, the 2023 goals are to try to keep finding new runs in places where um, river herring or eels have not been observed. And then there's many streams where we know they, they exist, but we don't, and even where fish passes just have them put in, where we don't know how far upstream they're moving. The Carls River, for example, I showed you that, that dam from Argyle Lake. We know they can get past that dam, but we've, they've never really been observed anywhere upstream of um, Argyle Lake. So that's, there's some other cases like that where we're trying to see how far they can go. Um, and then again, those priority sites from the restoration strategy. Uh, when we're going out to view, to search for these things, we're generally encouraged volunteers to go to places where there's the, either they're, they're at a dam where the fish can't go any further, or the, the, the river stream is sort of restricted and creating a pinch point where they're sort of forced to congregate. Um, and then, you know, calm water is obviously clear water, calm and clear is much easier to see than sort of turbulent water. So. Uh, and then shallow water. If they're, you know, these are fish that are going to stay in the middle of the water column. So if there's deep water, they're going to be sometimes hard to see. And generally, this, you know, these things all sort of, sort of point towards being at the first barrier, the place where they are, you know, on that map where the color changes from red, uh, from green to red. So that point where they're going to go as far as they can, and they're going to, they're going to congregate and basically stay there. Uh, we ask people to try to get out twice a week um, when the visibility is good, but you know sometimes varying that doesn't always you know, getting on different tides, not always going exactly the same time of day. Um, we have found that in in many of our streams, the fish tend to move at night, and we think that's just because of high uh, predation from sort of visual predators like cormorants and 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 herring gulls. So. Um, if you can get to a site safely and, and watch at night, that's that's always great. 
And again, 15 minutes at one at each site. Uh, this is not a in the water survey. This is a stay out of the water survey and, and be dry. So we, you know, you don't need to, getting in the water is only going to scare the fish away. So we're not, you don't need to get in the water. So stay, stay dry and stay safe. Uh, in the daytime, polarized glasses really do help a lot. If you, if you have access to them, it helps cut the glare so you can see into the water. Um, I'll touch on this. River herring are cryptic and beware of imposters. Uh, cryptic is a you know, word that means the animals that are designed to be camouflaged in their natural environment. So there's you know a couple, I don't know, 15 or so river herring in this image on top of this sort of gravelly, sandy river bottom. And they're, you know, they're dark on top and they're very difficult to see against that kind of a bottom. So when you're looking for a spot to view, it helps to find sort of a light background, either because it's really light sand or some vegetation. And you can see the fish that are over this, this uh, submerged vegetation are much easier to see than the ones to the left over the sandy vegetation, I mean, sandy bottom. And then beware of imposters. In this image, there's a couple of river, river herring, and then this, there's a, um, a brook trout there um, sort of pointed towards 10 o'clock, just much sort of huskier looking fish, uh, much wider, much uh, thicker. Alewife there, brook trout there. Um, these are river herring on the top and carp, carp are, you know, you're not gonna find a 25 inch river herring. If they're 25, if they're, you know, river herring tend to be sort of 12 to 15 inches. They don't get much bigger than that. So if you see some big fish milling about in the river somewhere that you know are goldish color or something, they're they're not river herring. And then this has been a big uh, confusing point over the past uh, five years or so as the Atlantic menhaden or bunker populations have rebounded and they've been they've been inshore a lot and they gather. They do sometimes push into the rivers and streams. They're not diadromous fish, but they get pushed in by by um, bluefish and and striped bass and other predators. Um, these fish are often right near the surface of the water and lined up like they are in this image. So that's something that river herring don't do. River herring are gonna be in the middle of the water column and milling about each other. They're not gonna be lined up like this. This is again, that same mill river image that I showed you. I showed you the, these fish from in the water before, but this is what they look like from above, kind of milling about each other not lined up, not at the top. And bunker can be quite a bit bigger. They can get sort of, you know, up to two feet long and and they're they're just bigger fish than river herring are. Um, scales every year we you know one of the first things we we see anywhere on, on the island are these are pictures like this. Before anybody sees a fish, uh, you know, the raccoons find them first. And generally the first sign is that there's some scales on this on the shore, and you might think, well, I'm never going to see scales. Um, but in you know this time of year, when there's not when everything is sort of brown and, and not there's not a lot of thing, not a lot of green uh, vegetation growing, and there's leaf litter, they're quite easy to see. And they especially if it's Sunday, they do sort of glitter in the sunlight sometimes. So you can look for that on the shoreline. Uh, I mentioned that the the gulls will gather when there's fish around. They you know they tend to know they're there before we do. So if you see gulls gather this like this, you know, there's probably some river herring around. Uh, night herons, you know, if you see four or five night herons over, over a creek somewhere, uh, there's probably a reason that they're there. And same with osprey. If you see osprey sitting sort of in a wooded area over a creek where you don't usually see them, that's probably why. So these are all things to look for and can be recorded on our, um, our data submission uh, form. And I uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up and turn it over to Ariel. Thank you, Enrico. Mm -hmm. Once you stop sharing your screen, then I can go ahead and share mine. Perfect. Okay. So like Enrico mentioned, I'm going to show you all how to access the River Herring and American Eel Survey. And we can do this in three different ways, technically. Um, can you see my web browser? Okay. Yep. Okay, yes. great. So 
to use your computer and use your computer browser if you're more familiar with that and more comfortable versus the mobile device. What you can do is just head on to our website at ctuck.org. This is what your main page will be. And then you're going to head over to get involved. And under our community science projects, the second to last survey is the River Herring and American Eel Survey. So this web page specifically is going to be a great resource for um, any follow-up, any resource that you might need to revisit. So for example, you'll see here, we have the 2023 River Herring and Eel River uh, uh, survey resources. So you have those protocols, the various regional sites, um, and the links to the surveys. So the survey that I'm going over right now is all of Long Island, but there is a separate Westchester survey, which you can access from this webpage. This is where we will house the recording that we are doing now. So once this is over, you can check back shortly and we will have that up on here for you to review. And then as you go down, you can see that the survey is embedded directly into the web page. So if you prefer to use your computer, you could just hop on our website and check out this page. And I'll just go through some of the questions here. They're pretty straightforward. Anything with the red asterisk, you have to submit information for. Um, so if you go to enter in your data and for some reason it doesn't let you, make sure to just double check that you have information in those red asterisk boxes. Um, so it asks for your name, email, river or stream, and these are all in alphabetical order. So you would just scroll down through the drop down menu. But if for whatever reason there isn't a stream here listed, you can click other and then type in that river stream. From here, we have the geolocation question. I, I would suggest you allow it to use your location. I'll specifically talk more about this on the mobile device. And if you're using this in the field, it will make more sense. Um, but if you decide to submit your information from home after being out in the field, just make sure that you are logging in the location of the stream you surveyed earlier that day, um, because it will automatically show the location where you are right now, if that makes sense from your computer. Um, then you go down and again, straightforward date time of your survey, um, title stage, and we have a resource for that that I'll go into a little bit more with the phone, water temperature, weather, and then of course, whether river herring are present, how many, same goes for American eels, and then other species. So like Enrico had mentioned, if you see herring gulls or osprey, um, you can make note of that. So in case you don't see river herring at that time, but you notice those indicator species, that's some great information to have. In addition, we have spots where you can take live photos or upload photos that you took earlier in the day here. And then at the end, we have a notes section. So if there's anything that you feel um, would be important for us to know, please feel free to type it in right there. So that's one way. And now I'm going to show you the two ways you can access the survey from your mobile device. So I'm just going to switch over here and show you my phone. Okay, do you see my phone screen? Okay, great. So in order to access the River Herring Survey through the Survey123 mobile app, you're going to have to download the free mobile app first. And we have that all set up from that web page as well. So I'm just going to go navigate back to our website, which is ctuck.org. And this is what it looks like from your mobile device. You're going to hit menu, get involved. And again, under community science projects, you're going to choose river herring and eel survey. So that's what it looks like from your phone. Again, the recording, that survey is still embedded in the web page. 
So you can use it there as well on your phone. And then we have accessing the Survey123 mobile field app. So again, you're gonna need to download that app from whatever phone provider store you have. And since we're on our phone right now, we can't scan the QR code to access the survey, but we do have a link here under the second bullet point. So you can access the survey by clicking there. And if for whatever reason you wanna go back and just use the browser, you can do that right there by hitting that open and browser button, but we wanna look at the survey using the field app. So as you can see, I have the app downloaded and it automatically opened the app on my phone. What's important to note here is that you do not need an ArcGIS online account. You will just choose the third option that says continue without signing in. So there it has the survey all populated and ready to go. Again, name, email, stream. And I just wanted to note here under the GeoPoint question, the crosshair, if you choose that, it will automatically show you where you are in that moment. You can drag this around and then it'll open it into a wider map. I usually just use the map option. It goes straight to that. So it shows you where I am. You can at the top search for a location or put coordinates into that search bar. On the right side panel, you can see that four squares. You can change the base map. So if you're more comfortable with using something that looks like this, it might take a second to load. Um, you can change how that looks. I like to use imagery with labels. You can use the plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out. And then if you hit the crosshair again, it brings you back to where you are. So once you have that location set, you would hit the bottom right corner, that check, and you're all set to go. Again, I would recommend to allow location services on your phone to make sure you're getting the most accurate um, reading of your location. From here down, again, we have the date, time of the survey. And then here's that title stage that I just wanted to go into quickly. We have resources for local tides. If you wanted to check that out, I get the prompt that says, would you like to use your current location? So yes. And for me, my nearest tide gauge is Cold Spring Harbor. So that's what I'm going to choose. And from there, you can see what time low tide is, high tide is, which could then give you the information for answering um, those questions. Um, so if you have a rising tide, for example, you would be in between the times of 1.30 and 7.45. So say you headed out at five o'clock, you would be choosing rising tide and then vice versa. If you were going from a high tide to a low tide, in between there, you would go and choose the falling tide. If I decided to go out tonight at 7.45, I would then choose slack tide. So it's either at low tide exactly or at high tide exactly, where you have that slack tide where the water's not moving in or out too much. Now, if I can go back here, Again, if you have a thermometer, you can do the water temperature. Um, and that's pretty much everything. And the one thing I also wanted to note is after you're done filling out this information, you would click the bottom right check, or if you decide to save it for later, you can save it as a draft. So if you wanted to hook up to Wi-Fi or whatever the reason might be, you can hit the top left X, this prompt will come up and then you can hit that top save in drafts. Now, if you see right there, that orange circle, it's basically just saying that you have a survey in your drafts that you need to finish and submit later. And what's really cool about the survey one, two, three app is that you can house all of your community science surveys in one place. So you can see I have Batmap, Long Island, um, Coyote Tracker, Terrapin Watch, and also my River Herring survey. So it's a really cool kind of one-stop uh, shop situation for our community science projects.
So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. And I think that's all for the survey portion. Does anyone have any questions about the survey itself before we go into the breakout sessions? I, I just, I was going to just add one thing that I noticed in the chat about using GoPros and, and Byron Young responded that it is, it is a great way to, in situations where you're not sure what's in the water. It's very easy to dip a, a GoPro in and get some quick video. And um, so, yeah, if you have access to one, it's a great tool. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I actually just have one note here that might influence a breakout session. So we have a question from Ira. Uh, they said they live in New York City and had planned to do North Shore LI, but prefer something closer. Any recommendations? Used to live in Bayville. Um, so Jimena, do you think we should transfer them over to Westchester or? Um, are we doing separate breakout groups for North Shore versus Westchester? Oh, that's true. We're doing it for both. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. We got it. All right. Um, so yes. So now we are going to split out into the breakout groups. I'm going to send you all to your respective groups in just a moment. Um, just as a reminder, there are the three regional uh, training rooms. Jimena perez Viscasias and Lily Genovese will be hosting the North Shore Westchester Breakout Group. Pete Topping from Peconic Baykeeper and Barry Volson from Peconic Estuary Partnership will be hosting the East End Breakout Group. And lastly, the South Shore Breakout Group will be hosted by Enrico Nardone and Sally Kellogg and Jackie Defeaty from both the South Shore Estuary Reserve. So I am going to hit the breakout rooms now. And hopefully that all goes smoothly. <laughs> Did it work? We're so close. Okay. <laughs> going to have to do this manually. Okay, Enrico, you should have gotten a notification. Valerie. East. Hello all, we have six uh, so far. Pete, any idea of how many do we have coming across? Uh, this this may be it. I'm not I'm not sure what the breakdown was of the people that were actually in attendance. Okay. It seemed like a fair amount of people registered that maybe didn't weren't able to make it tonight or just gonna watch the live the recording. Okay, we have two unassigned okay. participants. Uh, there was one other person that had to leave. Um, I recognize her name. I'll just end up sending her the recording. Okay. This might be it. This might be it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have... To... Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Super. Okay. Uh... Welcome to our 2023 Long Island Volunteer River Herring and Eel Survey. This is the East End Regional Group. My name is uh, Barry Volson. I'm from the um, from PEP, the Conic Estuary Partnership. I am the Program Resource Program Program Resource Natural Resource Manager, and we will do a round, we'll do a, a who's here uh, for attendance. Uh, Pete, you want to go ahead? 
Yeah, so I'm uh, Pete Topping. I'm the executive director and uh, baykeeper with Peconic Baykeeper. So we're based out of <clears throat> Hampton Bays, New York, um, but work throughout the Peconic Estuary um, and also a little bit west as well. Hi, I'm Valerie. I'm PEPS Outreach Coordinator. I work with Barry. Byron, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Byron Young. <laughs> I've been working on river herring restoration since 1995 in the Peconic and elsewhere around Long Island. Um, I work with, with all of the groups, but primarily on the Peconic estuary. Joseph? Uh, Joseph Gittleman. Um... Presently enjoying retirement, former uh, USDA employee. Uh, I ran the Asian Longhorn Beetle Eradication Program on Long Island for close to 20 years and uh, since retired and have plenty of free time. That's hmm. excellent. Hey, hey Barry, maybe um, maybe we could just also suggest that uh, the people that are doing the survey just kind of mention where they um, might be from or where they're living or like kind of areas that they might be able to survey. Yes. So for the volunteers, could you please uh, say where you're from and what area you're interested in surveying? Uh, Joe Gittleman, I'm in Santa Mariches. I can do anything east or west of Santa Mariches. Okay. Um, my name is Don Medler. I'm in uh, North Sea, uh, new to this. I'm off on Tuesdays and Sundays, so that's when my time primarily my daylight time would primarily be but looking forward to getting involved <clears throat> welcome thanks for your help thanks okay so we'll we'll get started here um what we envision here is going through uh the uh list I of sites have, sorry to interrupt i think yeah, we have two more folks we if do. they want to introduce themselves as well um Nosh, if I'm not pronouncing that right, please correct me. You can go ahead. Yep, no, hey guys, it's it's Nosh here. Um, I actually did a few surveys last year in the Southampton area, um, and you know, hoping to help out where I can in in sort of similar areas in the East End. Welcome back, Nosh. Excellent, thank you. And Robert, you can go ahead and introduce yourself if you'd like. Yeah, I'm from Port Jefferson. I did a, I did some surveys last year, um, very specific. To Port Jefferson and Setauka. Excellent. And Ariel. Oh, that's a, that's our Ariel. Oh, sorry, Ariel. Good. Awesome. <laughs> sure, everything's going all right in here. Yes, so far everything's, everything's good. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so once again, welcome to the Eastern Regional Training. So, how we envision this is working down a list of sites along the uh, Peconic watershed, the east, basically the Eastern towns. Uh, so a little bit of introduction. There are two major runs in a uh, in the Peconic watershed. Uh, Airwife Creek, seen down here, and the Peconic River. Um, hey, Gary, your screen is still on. It's not on presenter mode, and it's still on that first slide. Uh, okay. Slide. Okay. Uh, I find it helps if you just do share screen, screen one, and then it'll show whatever you're looking at. Okay, good. Let me do this. Okay, and you see my screen now. Um, yes, but it's it's not in um slideshow. Can you put it into slideshow? And we'll see if that's working. Okay, are we now? Hmm. Okay. Again. 
There we go. It's in full screen mode. You're Super. good. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. So, um, All right, so uh, like I was saying, there was there's two major runs, two major alewife spawning sites in the, in, in the Peconic watershed, alewife, alewife Creek and the and Peconic River. Um, alewife Creek is for the most part, it's, un, uninhabit, it's an unimpounded uh, system. And it runs from North, North Sea to a uh, big, uh, big fresh pond. The second, the second lattice run is uh, the Peconic River and it is heavily impounded uh, with dams. Uh, and other other sites where alewife have been seen in, in, in significant numbers is Lunguni and Lake Montauk. Um, in the last, in, in over, prior to 2010, uh, there were six dams in the Peconic along the Peconic River. At the moment, uh, four of those dams have some ha, have some has a fist patch on them. Um, at the beginning, we have a Grand Grandjeville that was done in, in 2000 in 2010. Uh, Woodhull, which was completed uh, last year, 2022. Uh, Forge, which is completed this year in 2023 in February of this year, and Edwards in, 2000, in, in 2016. Uh, this is the Nietzsche, the Nietzsche fish fish uh, fish passage at Gangebel. By the way, this uh, this site has a camera installed uh, yearly, and uh, we are able to to monitor the airwife coming upstream, coming coming through for this fish fishway. The second uh, fishway along along. Uh, Peconic, it is it's on, it's on a little, little Peconic as uh, Woodhull, and this was completed this year. This is the uh, Baron Young Fish Passage, and Baron is in this group. This group so Baron, please uh, say nod out to you. And thank you for all your uh, efforts in, uh, rest in helping us restore fish al and along the Peconic watershed and uh, throughout Long Island for the most part. Uh, this is the uh, Fish Passage at at a Woodhull, this passage, this passage also has a camera on it. And going upstream from Grand Jubil is uh, is Forge. Uh, Upper Mills at this moment is uh, is is uh, is um, does not have a fish passage along uh, uh, does not have a fish passage on it right now, but is in the process of uh, of, uh, of in the process of, get, of getting of, of installation. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, wow. uh, fish cannot by bypass upper mills to go to to forge. So this is one of the sites that we will be interested in the Peconic River. Um, what I'm going to do, as we, as I mentioned, these names here, I'll uh, ask Baron to give some more information on the different sites in uh, in the Peconic, uh, in the Pocon along the Peconic, along the Peconic <clears throat> River that we should be uh, uh, vo volunteers can can uh, can volunteer to 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 site for for airwives. So, Baron, feel free to add anything for along the Peconic River. The the one site that could use some effort this year is Upper Mills, uh, with Grandjewel open, Woodhull open. Those two are pretty well covered, but you can you can also go there and and pretty pretty, pretty much sure you're going to see some alewives. Certainly at Woodhull, not so much at Grandjewel, but the the fish. If there's a many run a, a good run this year, there'll be fish alewives concentrating just below the gauging station, which is downstream of the dam. Uh, that's a spot <clears throat> that you can go. You just need to be careful of ticks as you walk along the trail that leads down to the gauging station. Um, you know, just use precautions there. Yeah. Um, at this point, no no alewives can make it over that dam to the other two fish passages upstream. Yeah, so this is a picture <clears throat> of the... Uh... Yeah, here's the, the photo in the bottom right is the gauging station. With high flows, alewives can make it over that, but they can't make it through the two culverts that you see in the left-hand picture. All right. Um, so, Baron, where would you think would be a good site to uh, to visit? Along uh, on the right-hand side, on the at the gauging station. Right. Okay. Where the picture was taken from is a concrete bulkhead. 
If you stand there, you can look into the pool downstream and you'll see the, you'll, <laughs> if the visibility is good. You'll see fish milling around there. There's also a little path that goes a little bit further way downstream, maybe 15 to 20 feet, where you can get right on the edge of the water and potentially view them there. Okay. So if you go up to the top picture, um, <clears throat> there's, yeah, the, I can't do much here. Um, the gauging station is, is pointed out there. What you'd have to do is park on the north side the upstream or the at the north side, walk across the dam and the trail that goes down um, <clears throat> under the power lines to the gauging station. So Baron is talking about walking across this road over yep. here to the, the gauging station. Right. Yeah, and it'd be yes, and you'd want to walk down to where the gauging station is. The gate, you'll see a house, a little brick house, and the weir is just downstream of that. Yep, that's right. So these are the sites along uh, Peconic River. Another another location that, and it's it parking is a bit of a problem. Um, assuming that alewives use the Woodhull Dam site. Um, you could go upstream to Wildwood Lake, where the stream empties out of the lake, uh, and view from there. It is parking is restrictive, but if you're only going to stay for a few minutes, um, you probably would be okay. And, and you can see the stream, the blue line that comes out. It's, um, it's right now. Yeah. So that's another spot that could spend a little bit of time, but just be careful of parking. Don't. Don't overstay your welcome. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you, Baron. Okay, this is Edwards, Edwards, uh, Edwards Passage. Uh, and this is a, a video of fish, of your life of fish. Baron, is this uh, Woodwell? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, this is an air life schooling at the bottom of the Woodhull Pond yep. below, the, below the fish passage. And hopefully all of those fish will return and go upstream into Wildwood Lake. Right. And Baron, as, as of this date, you haven't seen no fish at Woodhull? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Um, where do we survey? We usually survey downstream of most, of most of the impassable barriers, meaning at the fish passages. Uh, meaning, of course, the Peconic River. We have... Uh, Howard County, Elwife Creek, Langoni, um, Brook, Elwife Brook, and uh, Stepping Stone and uh, Stepping Stone and Little Reed, Big Reed, sorry, Little Reed and Big Reed Ponds. All right, so we'll break to the uh, continuation to the main sites. Okay. So Howard County. Um, Pete or oh, Byron, please feel free to jump in here. Yeah, the Hubbard County, there's a, a step pool fish ladder there. Um, <clears throat> the red circle is where it is. And there's a trail that leads in. Um, wish I could help you. Yes, yes, there's the trail. Mm -hmm. Again, watch out for ticks. Um that one, there has been some observations of alewives there. I personally have not seen any. Um, that's maybe a five-minute, ten-minute walk from where you'd park your car on the edge of 24. Uh, you'd park right, right in there where, the, where it joins and then walk in. Um, <clears throat> that one we could, you know, certainly use some people going in and looking at. You might even encounter the pair of bald eagles that's nesting in there somewhere. Yep. Baron, I also uh, I saw uh, American eels last there last year, so I think yeah. it's important to include oh. that. Um, not only are we looking for the the river herring, um, but also American eels, and uh, they may be getting into areas where river herring are not. Oh, right. very important, Pete. Thank you. And this is the the uh, 
That's the fish waves. The step pools, if you will. Right. <clears throat> Very simple operation, but hopefully effective. This side, right. Uh, next, we have Elwife Creek. Pete, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, so um, I think uh, Byron and I are both pretty familiar with Elwife Creek. Um, but El Elwife Creek, I know, uh, I believe Don um, said he was in the North Sea area. Um, yeah. This is uh, right, right in your backyard. Um, and so Elwife Creek is named for the river herring that run through there, the Elwives, and that goes to Big Fresh Pond in North Sea. Um, so that run comes through North Sea Harbor, up under a culvert at Noyak Road, um, meanders through the woods, comes under another culvert at North Sea Road, and then eventually comes out um, into Big Fresh Pond by Elliston Park. Um, <clears throat> This, it may have, the numbers may have changed a little bit with some of the fish passages that have been put in in the Peconic River, uh, but this was the most um, significant run of Elwives on Long Island. Um, I'm not sure what those numbers are right now, uh, but the best areas to uh, survey are at the Noyak Road uh, culvert. It's, it's a little tricky to get to if you're not too familiar with the area um, and there's a lot of traffic to contend with these days. Um, the safest place to observe is uh, where the North Sea Road culvert is, where that second pin is. There's a nice shoulder um, that you can park on. And if you- uh, it, looks like, it looks like the guardrail has been collapsing into the stream there. Yeah, I think um, I think there must have been some sort of vehicle uh, vehicle um, collision with that. Um, I'm actually going to be meeting with some people from the county yeah. next week to talk about some of the issues there. Um, but but that area right where those where those cones are on the downstream side is a really good spot to monitor because even though the OWs can get over that. Um, over that culvert, they often congregate there, and you'll see evidence of them if they're moving through as well. Uh, next, we have uh, Ngoni Brook. Yeah, Ligony Brook is a intermittent stream. At low water levels, there's no stream water, there's no water flowing. Uh, you need high high water levels to get sufficient water for the fish to make it from the bay up into Long Pond. Um, <clears throat> the, the fish will try to come up with the tide, but they get so, so far and there's no water. So they have to turn back or not make it at all. But it's something that should be looked at if there's water flowing um, on uh, Sag Harbor Turnpike. Uh, you should look for fish there, and you could probably walk up along the stream if there's water and check. But I don't know, with the low with low water levels we've had for the last year or so, I would not expect much there. What do you think, Pete? Uh, so I had, um, I, I agree with you, Byron, about the, the low water level. So uh, Ligony Brook comes from uh, Long Pond, um, which is off in Sag Harbor in the uh, Long Pond Greenbelt. Um, and that feeds into the back waters of Sag Harbor. Um, and I have had reports um, as recent as last year of Elwives that were in the lower reaches of Ligony Brook. They weren't able to get it um, to get very far, but they were kind of up in the mud. Um, but there are Elwives trying to use that. So I think, um, yeah, you know, I would say trying to survey on the on the lower end of that system um, would be good. So from Ligini Brook, uh, this is the culvets. This is the one downstream of the of brick a big claim crossing. <clears throat> yeah, those are around where Sag Harbor Sag Harbor Turnpike goes through. I think what Pete was talking about is further downstream toward the bay where this tide water comes up in. And I don't know that I don't remember the name of the street where you could stop and take a look. 
where does this enter the base? It it comes um it goes into the back areas of uh Sag Harbor Cove. Okay. Um so you know the fish would basically have to come through Sag Harbor and around like that bay point area mm -hmm. uh to, to make their way in there. I went recently and everything looked very dry. I like walked to the creek bed. I think it has been for um at least a few years. But yeah, I'd be interested to see if where it is entering the bays, if fish are trying to um to enter that stream. Well, I think it, I think there's been one instance since the last time I saw them. I saw a fish entering Long Pond in 2010. It was a very high flow year. Um, and we were walking the stream looking for potential improvements. And lo and behold, we encountered a couple of schools of fish moving up into Long Pond that year. And I think there may have been one year since then that fish were observed going into Long Pond. Yeah, Barry, if you if you zoom in, in right on the Sag Harbor spot, that, that should pop up. Long Pond, and if you could direct me Good. Yeah, you just got to have to zoom out a little bit. Right. So everyone, this is our, our CCTOX river revival map. And from that, we can um, so, um, zoom in and zoom out to specific locations. That, that may, uh, you, That's sorry, you might be on a different long pond, actually. There. Yeah, you are on the <laughs> south side. Where the, where the red is. Um, mm, so uh, that's not our estuary. It's yeah. See where um, Sag Harbor is, right above, to the left of your mouse. Right above where it's red. Yes. Right, right there. Okay. I see. All right. So Ligony Brook, Long Pound. The intersection of Noyak and um, whatever that brick kiln or... Yeah, I think it's yeah, the, the other part of Noyak Road that comes out there. <clears throat> All right. There you go. Yes. And how do you pronounce that? Ligony? Mm. Yes. There's Ligony Brook right here. Yeah, where the star is, that would, you know, the street to the right of that is probably where you could view and see if there's any fish at all or any signs of fish. Yeah, right in there. I know. So you could park off here, I guess, at Byron or Pete? You could park down, uh, down by where the stream crosses under the highway. Okay. Right around here. Yeah. Okay. I I seem to recall there's enough, you know, uh, space on the side of the road to park. Okay. Okay. Uh, next we have um, Sky Pond. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, Skoy, Skoy Pond is, um, if if anyone's out in the East Hampton area, uh, back in Northwest Woods, uh, Skoy Pond is pretty close to Cedar Point Park. Um, so kind of like Elwife Creek, there are a lot of these areas around that 
<clears throat> a lot of these spots around that area were named for for the alewives um and they they would come typically into alewife pond um from uh northwest harbor um just a little bit east of sag harbor and then there's a small uh small little creek that runs from Skoy Pond, um, which is set back a ways in the woods. And then that comes under a wife Brook Road. Um, there, the culvert under that road is essentially um, just one or two pipes at this point in time. Um, I'm not sure if or when uh, a wife have been observed there um, as of recent, but it'd be great to just uh, have a couple visits there this season. So this is the north side of the road on over here on the south side of the two, the two pipes emptying into uh emptying into the brook. Uh next we have Lake Montauk. Uh, Peter Baron, feel free. Yeah. I think if you if you scroll down, I think it might give a better idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Byron, do you want to talk about Big Reed or, or I can? Well, Big Reed Pond has, there is evidence of alewives making it into the pond in the past. Um, the Freshwater Fisheries Unit electrofishing there caught juveniles. The stream from Lake Montauk into Big Reed is really choked with Phragmites. And I believe there's an effort uh, to open that up. Um, in the Red Square area. Um, and there have been a couple of issues with that. And when they rebuilt East Lake Drive, they um, kind of blocked off the stream from the bay. It had too much of a rise. They've modified that sense. So I think the alewives, if there's any there, can make it under East Lake Drive and into uh, Little Reed Pond and into that marshy area. Um, and they're persistent fish, and if they want to make it to Big Reed, I think they can, certainly in the spring. Um, it does need some improvements. If anybody's out there, you could look at East Lake Drive, or you could park uh, where that little brown spot is to the right of Little Reed and walk up the trail to to see the entrance into Big Reed. But it's really overgrown with Phragmites. Okay. So it's tough viewing. Yeah. Um, I've, I personally haven't seen alewives there, but I've had um, people report uh, seeing alewives. Um, so this spot, again, it's, it's along East Beach Drive um, uh, on Lake Montauk. And there's a little sandy spit, um, spit of beach. I think the locally it's called the Dreen which is where the where the drain comes out right mm -hmm. across the sand. Um, and that's that's where the alewives would be. Um, I've had some people also tell me that they kind of hang out in that area when the tide is too low. And sometimes they'll wait for like a, a bigger tidal cycle, like a fuller new moon before they push push over and they can actually make it uh, into the system. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, I agree with Pete. That would be the best place to go look for them. Um it's I just haven't made that trip frequently enough in the last four or five years to have any information. Stepping stones. Yeah, and and so uh, stepping stepping stones pond is on the south side of um or that area is on the south side of lake montauk off uh, old west lake drive um and so there's there's a a pond um on the south side of the road and then a culvert that goes under the road into lake montauk um the there's no um effective fish passage for them to for river herring to move through um, from Lake Montauk into Stepping Stones Pond, uh, but there have been um, scales um, from the river herring observed in that area. Um, I've uh, I I saw some a few years ago, and other people have as well. So if um, if you're out in that area, that's another good 
good place to check out. Uh, will you uh, monitor on this side or on the side of the, of the on, cover? On the Lake Montauk the side. Lake side. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. They, they wouldn't be able to make it into Stepping Step, Stones, Stones Pond currently. All right. And to the pipes leading from Lake Montauk into Stepping Stones. Mm -hmm. These, by the way, are high and dry. Yeah, so it's a, it's a tidally, Lake Montauk is, even though it's Lake Montauk, um, it is uh, tidally affected because it's um, was, was uh, dredged a long time ago um, for all the, all the fishing boats. All right. Um, these are outside of our watershed, the um, Boy Scout camp, am I correct, Pete? uh that area is um so that's in wading river i believe right i don't yes, i'm not sure if anyone um <clears throat> anyone in the audience would be interested in knowing about that site byron might be able to i have i have i live it. near that site and i check it out once in a while um it has had it has supported alewives um in the in the marsh area unfortunately the homeowners uh on the beach way uh, were upset that the water was flooding their basements, so they opened up the channel and drained the marshy area. Uh, I haven't seen animal wives there for a number of years, but if somebody is, you know, is in the area and wants to walk down in there, they can. The weekends are bad because the Boy Scouts are in there, but you know, it's a small area. I know that the Boy Scouts are looking, uh, have a proposal in to do some feasibility work for rebuilding the dam and putting in a fish ladder. But I'm not sure where that stands. Okay. One of my uh, friends lives in um, that area in the Oak Hills uh, development on the okay. side of the creek. He goes down to the beach there frequently to fish. And he and his wife's um, uh, viewed alewives trying to make their way <clears throat> across the bar over there at low tide uh, last year and the year before. Oh, nice. Nice. Yep. Have them report that observation to you, and you can fill in the in the form for it. He should have been on this call. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> I'll encourage him to, you know, continue, continue to keep his eyes open there. That's great. Yeah, that's the upper end of the, the south end of the tidal flats just before it goes into the little pond where they'd like to spawn. And I have seen the alewives congregated at that culvert. Also a very large snapping turtle. Wow. Um huh? Halsey Lake Nick Lane. Uh yeah, so this um this night I if Nosh is still on, I know um I think he checked out this this area a few times last year. Um Halsey Halsey Neck um lane is kind of an interesting spot. This is uh so it's not in the Peconic estuary, it's in the South Shore estuary. Um and it is um basically in the easternmost part of Shinnecock Bay. Um, and if, uh, so the L wives in this, in this system, they move, um, they move under Halsey Neck Road, which is in Southampton village. And then they move through a series of, uh, ditches in the marsh under a private driveway and then through, um, through an earthen, a pipe and an earthen dam, and then eventually to Halsey <clears throat> Neck um, Pond. So it's one of those spots where, um, you really have to uh, kind of hand it to them because it shows shows how persistent uh, they are. Um, if you want to survey this site, um, what I would suggest is uh, you can park. Um, it's a little off the map, but Halsey Neck Beach in Southampton Village, uh, you can park in the off season, um, which is, uh, you know, encompasses um, the river herring monitoring season. Um, and then it's just a short walk to where that where that circle is. That's where the culvert is. Um, 
you probably aren't likely to see Elwives themselves because they can move through this area pretty well. Um, but you are likely to see uh, lots of scales and other evidence um, that they've, they've been in there. Um, some of the other areas in that um, in that run are either private property or uh, really, really tough to access. Um, but if anyone's interested in um, doing some bushwhacking, I'll put my email in the chat when we're, we're done and I'm happy to meet you there. <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Next, we have Meekox Bay. Um, Byron, I don't know. Do you, do you have a lot of background on Meekox? I can, I can. Well, Meekox historically has supported alewife spawning. The uh, Southampton Tustees opened the breach into the ocean uh, in the spring to let the water level down so it doesn't flood homes. And when they do that, any alewives or the alewives in the area in the ocean will enter the bay and they will move up into the upper, the northern end of Meacox Bay. Um, the Mill Pond area is an area that the trustees are interested in looking to see if they can get alewives over that dam. They do spawn successfully there. Um, when they reopen the breach in the fall, um, the, the amount of prey species that go out into the ocean concentrates all of the predators in front of Meacox. Um, it's a spot that um, if anybody is around the, the way, um, water mill area, go up Old Mill Road to the Water Mill Museum and come back and look um, into the bay from the bridge. Uh, it's a relatively shallow area. And if there's any fish in there, you should be able to see them. Uh, there shouldn't be anything on the other side because the dam is quite high. Um, they're just beginning to look at potential fish passage options without having to tear up everything. It's a historic site. Yeah. So um, w when I've when I've gone to that site, I I haven't seen um, Elwives swimming around that area, but I have. Um, once again, a lot of times you don't actually see the alewives, but you you'll see large scales or evidence that raccoons or other predators were there. You'll see the carcasses. Um, and if you go to where the old water mill is, um, where where Byron had mentioned right there, uh, you can kind of look over and there's a bit of a, like a a bulkhead and um, some beams that go across. And I've seen scales um, right in that area. So it's hmm. So they they are making it to there, uh, but um, as Byron mentioned, the the outflow is too high for them to actually get into Mill Pond. Um, these are the southeast southeast uh, long streams, which are mm. covered by um, by Enrico and the other group. Well, this, okay. This hold, hold on. I think Joe was Joe was in Center Marches, right? Yes. Yeah. So this uh, this is a um, site. If you're in Center Marches, you're probably familiar with. It's uh, at Terrell River County Park. Yeah, I can um, walk. So there's the uh, there's the Audubon um, Center right where that little sandy beach is, mm -hmm. um, and so and then there's uh, basically a culvert that goes goes under the road there um and there have i i have heard of elwives that have been spotted in that that area yeah, so uh, vicky o'neill spotted them a couple of years ago um so that would be a great area uh, especially if you're there regularly <laughs> to to have surveyed so would you view yes. from, from above or from, or from below uh it would be on the on the down Almost downstream downstream yeah yeah okay yeah it's across this it's across montauk highway or yeah it's across the highway from this recreation center from the brookhaven and audubon center all right so parking uh, on that side of the road at terrell river county park which is a very short walk to that uh, culvert oh yeah that's true too yes yep yep that's the safer bet. Park there yeah, sorry. and walk on that side of the highway. 
Uh, do we know if the what, are the eel eel wives eel wives looking for still water? Or are they looking for lack of salinity? What is what are they looking for? Basically, they're looking for still water. Uh, they don't like to spawn in rapids, so they want to get into the lakes or into a where the stream kind of slows down, um, and they can spawn. Uh, so they want to be in the lakes. That's where they're headed. Um, salinity, the, historically, they have spawned below the dams uh, in the top of the estuary where it's more fresh than saline. So they wouldn't spawn in Great South Bay or Peconic Bay, but they'd spawn in the headwaters of the streams that lead into it or into the just below the dams. Thank you. Okay. And moving down, we have Sita uh, Creek in Eastport. Yeah, that's. Um... Oh, okay. Um, I've looked at that one a couple of times. It's kind of tough. The the dam is sitting right under Montauk Highway. Um, I have not seen anything. The spillway is on the left side of the water body. Um, so it has some potential, but, you know, I'm not sure how many fish come back in there. And I have not heard of anybody seeing anything there. But it still doesn't. Eels would be something you could look for. Um, but as far as the alewives, I have not heard anything from there. I'll give that one a good look as well. Okay. Sure. Great. I take it the eels are a lot harder to see. Yes. You want to look at the edge of the dam. You're not necessarily going to see them swimming in the in the water column unless they're over if, unless it's very shallow and over sandy bottom. Uh typically what you'll find them is along the edge of the dam, trying to crawl up the crevice in the where it's perpendicular. Yep. And you have to kind of watch because you, at first you just gloss over them. You think it's just a rough, rough and concrete or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden it's moving. So I have trouble finding them myself. The, the first time I saw that on the Montauk Highway in Oakdale, I thought I was in a swarm of leeches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, we have Spinnick River. This is this is in Mauritius hmm. Bay. I am not familiar with this one. Okay, but okay, I think any of these streams that cross under Montauk Highway that have an impoundment above them right. is a potential candidate. Um, doesn't mean you have to look at all of them every year. But if you happen to have a few minutes, um, stop and take a look and see what you can see, uh, whether it's just for the eels or maybe a, an eel life. I'm sure there are eels in every single one of those uh, little impoundments upstream of the dam. Right. So there's the cultivated north side and there's underneath of the mill. Now, with something like that culvert you just showed, if there is any separation from the water, maybe at high tide to be all right, but any separation, uh, eels can't make that journey. They have to have something to either swim through or cling to to get up into that culvert. So if low water, they won't be able to get into that. Yeah, they wouldn't be able to. Uh, alewives, if there's enough water coming out of the culvert, they might be able to do it. But it depends on what's on the other side. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. Saspatuck River. Um. That's pretty much all tide water there. Um. You'd want to look further upstream. 
Um, I think Aspetuck Creek goes into the Quag Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. Um, I have seen American eels there, and there have been reported uh, alewives there, but years and years ago. Um, that one, I think, if you're going to go look, there's a, let's see, this is down, this is pretty much all tide water. If, if you could go further up um, toward the Quag Wildlife Refuge, there's a narrow, there's a small bridge that goes across the stream and then it goes into a wooded swamp area before it gets to the refuge. Um, you might go onto the refuge and walk along the trail to the dam and look downstream from the dam to see what you can see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, that's this is where I was. Yep, on South Country Road. You could look there in the circle. Mm -hmm. And then uh the Quag Wildlife Refuge, you'd go to the okay. Um, there's a trail, a hiking trail that comes back. Uh oh, and you can see the dam, okay, from the the blue marker that has the Quag Wildlife Refuge. Right. Come back to the left just a little bit. And there's another kind of a gray area down, down on the edge of the water. Come back down. Now go to your right. Keep going to the right. Keep going. Keep going right, right there. Um, oh, no, that's the center. It's, it's probably back to the left. You'll see the trail. It's easy right there. Um, there's two spots. There's, there's one spot you can look downstream and potentially see eels. And if there's any eel wives in there, you'd see them there, too. <clears throat> that has all been improved recently. Um, there's a nice, you can pull off nicely and look there. And I think it's, you know, the access is better to the, to the other side of the road with the improvements. Okay. Yeah, and that's low tide downstream, but there's still enough water for eels and alewives to make it at low tide. And uh, these are all the sites that we have for the uh, <clears throat> east end. Well, those are the, you know, some of those places have, you know, you'll see alewives quite quite readily, certainly the Peconic River and Alewife Creek. Mm -hmm. um, you may encounter them in other places. Um, I would encourage folks, if they have a couple of favorite streams that they want to look at, to do that. Uh, you don't have to do the whole thing. We've got plenty of time. You know, we've been doing this for a number of years, and we keep adding new streams almost every year. I think when we started this back, when I started this back in the 90s, um, we knew of maybe a dozen or 15 streams that had remnant alewife runs. I think now we're up over 30 island-wide in Westchester County. And as I said, we keep adding one or two every year. Hey, Peter, do you have anything? Um, no, I don't. I, I, I think, um, you know, one, one thing that we... I guess would probably be good to mention. Um, well, a couple things. One, um, it I may have missed it earlier, but just a reminder that um, a negative obser observation is still data. So if you go to a area and survey and there's nothing there, um, please just submit the survey anyway, just so we know that that area has been surveyed um, and that we know there were no fish there at that time. Um, and then just um, if you're uh, if you're feeling a little frustrated um, by not seeing anything, um, one keep at it, and and two um, if you go some there there are some tendencies uh, for these for the wives they they kind of move through in waves, 
Um, but the main bulk of fish is likely to move through um, between late March and mid-April. It can vary a little bit from year to year. Um, and some of my most su successful observations have been um, one early in the morning, um, because I think a lot of these fish move through at night and I'm not going to be out there at night looking for them. Hmm. Um, but if you go there early in the morning, sometimes um, they're more likely to be there. They don't, I see very little uh, daytime mo movement. Um, and also if you uh, keep an eye on the tides, um, it seems uh, most of these creeks are pretty small. So when, um, when you have a good uh, full moon or new moon tide, the, the water level is going to be up several feet. Um, it not only gives the fish extra cover, but sometimes gives them the extra push that they need to be able to make it uh, through these streams. So those are, um, you know, just my tips for uh, like peak times um, to get out. And, um, and also just a reminder to um, just make sure you log your observations, even if you don't see anything. Those are good points, Pete, especially the no ob you know, the zero counts, the zero observations. The fact that we're looking at some of these streams. Um, my name and number is not on there, but if you need to reach out to me, you can go through Barry or Valerie or Pete. They have my number uh, if you have questions. Um, we'll be working on the Peconic all spring. Um, Katie McCarkin. Mc Katie McCartan uh, and Peter Daniels. <clears throat> K I, Kelly is from Suffolk Community College and Peter's from Hofstra. They'll be tagging alewives. They'll be looking at the cameras and camera data and we'll be catching fish for biological measurement throughout the spring. So uh, catch up with us. And um, if you want to go see that or help out, um, you're more than welcome. Also, if you're discouraged from not seeing fish or just want to join us, um, Bay Keep, Peconic Baykeeper and Pep will be doing an alewife walk at Alewife Creek on April 14th. So you can join us, get a refresher on um, some river herring things and, and hopefully see some fish as well. And Pete, you have one more going on too, right? If you want to drop that date. Yeah, I'm going to be doing a tour for, with uh, the South Fork Natural History Museum. Um, I believe it's the first Saturday in April. Um, and just see what day that is. Uh, oh, April Fool's Day, <laughs> um, <laughs> a April 1st. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be doing a, um, a walk with them. Um, so my emails on this, this if you wanna um, attend either or both of those. Um, and then uh, Ariel, Ariel, who is um, in the opening presentation, um, just said to mention that she'll be sending out follow-up information to everyone in the group um, that will include these resources as well as contact information. And of course, uh, folks, please encourage your friends and, uh, and neighbors to join us in, uh, in, the, volunteer, in the volunteer movement. And uh, I will send an email out with all information, including Barons. So if, and, feel, and feel free to contact us. And uh, thank you for taking part this year. And uh, Let's continue volunteering. Uh, one one little safety issue. Yes. Uh, a lot of these streams where the culverts yeah. run under the highway, it's, I mean, you're right up against the roadside. It's very narrow as far as walking goes. Uh, just consider maybe wearing a safety vest or a blaze orange cap, something visible to drivers. That's a very good point. Uh, be safe no matter what. If you think it's dangerous, don't do it. Yeah. You know, it's. Um, you know, we don't want to have anybody get hurt. So I second that, definitely. Safety first, always. Uh, anything else to add, folks? Okay, if not, uh, look out for um, following up emails from us and if any if we follow up information. And please feel free to contact us uh, for the season if any questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. So long.